Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of recovery since December the 27th of 1972. I encourage you to visit our website. It's titled uh, Two-Way Prayer and teaches about a form of prayer and meditation that was done in the Oxford group and in the early days of AA. And uh, my commitment is to try to get that simple method of prayer out to people in 12-step recovery. It, it totally changed my life, changed my understanding of the program too. And um, really uh, experienced a lot of people all around the world who are taking to it and uh, finding a whole new level of meaning and purpose to their lives as they do this form of prayer. Somehow it got lost and we're doing our best to try to bring it back. Also interested in the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, where it came from, how it developed, uh, what was going on in the early days. I'm interested in the spirituality and the psychology of that. And uh, the, the psychology brings us uh, to Harry Tebow. This is the final episode in the series we have done on him. Uh, I've had a number of uh, responses from people who have found it really, really helpful. I'd encourage you to get a book called The Collected Papers of Harry Tebow. It is published by Hazelden, contains the, uh, the paper we're going to discuss today and, and several others that we just didn't have time to get to. So add it to your library. It's, it's a really good book to have. Most of his stuff is available free online and you can find it that way uh, also. Jumping right in, and this is a talk rather than a paper, although he did write it, is titled Anonymity, the Ego Reducer. And it was delivered in 1955 at the 20th anniversary of Alcoholics Anonymous. He was invited to be one of the speakers there, uh, as was um, Sam Shoemaker, several other people who were really prominent in the, in the early days, the early history of, uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous. Ed Dowling, uh, the Jesuit priest, was another one who gave a talk there. And, and in this talk, he's, he's speaking about what he learned from uh, his study of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we're going to pick up on the paper, and uh, I'll make some comments as we go along. But uh, I'm going to skip the first page or two because it's kind of preliminary stuff. And what he says is um, he started attending meetings, and, and as he AA meetings. And as he did that, he thought that the group had, had hit upon a method that solved the problem of excessive drinking. I'm quoting now. In a sense, it was an answer to my prayers. After years of butting my head against the problem of treating the alcoholic, one could begin to hope. Hope for the hopeless. That is the theory or, or truth behind 12-step uh, recovery. In retrospect, uh, my first two or three years of contact with AA were the most exciting in my whole professional life. AA was then in its miracle phase. Everything that happened seemed strange, wonderful. Hopeless drunks were being lifted out of the gutter. Individuals who had sought every known means of help without success were responding to this new approach. To be close to any such group, even by proxy, was electrifying. In addition, professionally, a whole new avenue of problems of alcohol had opened up. Somewhere in the AA experience was the key to sobriety. There were the first authentic clue after many years of fruitless efforts. Needless to say, the possibilities ahead were most intriguing. Perhaps I could learn how AA worked and thus could learn something about how people stop drinking. All of which meant that I shared in the general excitement of those days. I could see some daylight ahead. My future in this regard was now clear. I would try to discover what made AA tick. In this quest for understanding, I would never have gotten beyond a first base if it hadn't been for Bill and many of the early members. The study of the 12 steps helped a bit, but a far greater importance were the insights already possessed by Bill and the others into the process through which AA brought about its results. I heard of the need to hit bottom, of the necessity for accepting a higher power, 
of the indispensability of humility, ideas that had never crossed my professional horizon and certainly had never influenced my non-professional thinking or attitudes. Revolutionary as they were, these ideas nevertheless made sense and I found myself embarked on a tour of discovery. I began to recognize more clearly what hitting bottom really implied. I began to do what I could to induce the experience in others, always wondering what was happening inside the individual as he went through the crisis of hitting bottom. Finally, fortune smiled upon me again, this time in the form of another patient. For some period, she had been under my new brand of psychotherapy designed to promote hitting bottom. For reasons completely unknown, she experienced a mild but typical conversion, which brought her into a positive state of mind. When the, when the ego stops fighting, when it, when it uh, surrenders, there's a unification of the mind that seems to happen at very, very, very deep levels. Um, and um, he speaks of it as connecting to a, a, a positive frame of mind, straight out of William James. I'm sure he was influenced by William James in his studies. James talks about the double-minded man and that double-mindedness as a result of pain or emotional tragedy, uh, hitting bottom is the expression we use. It opens the mind up to a reality that it had been fighting against. He says, led by her newly found spiritual elements, weak though they were, she started attending various churches in town. One Monday morning, she entered my office, her eyes ablaze, and at once commenced talking. I know what happened to me. I heard it in church yesterday. I surrendered. That's, that's that first step. <laughs> you don't go anywhere without the first step. It, it doesn't have to be whole, it doesn't have to be complete, but it has to have registered uh, and it has to have knocked the ego out of its place of supremacy so that the ego becomes humbled. With that word surrender, she had handed me my first real answers of what happens during this period of hitting bottom. The individual is fighting the admission of being licked, of admitting that he is powerless. If and when he surrendered, he quit fighting, could admit that he was licked, and could accept that he was powerless and needed help. If he did not surrender, a thousand crises could hit him and nothing would happen. The need to induce surrender became the new therapeutic goal. The miracle of AA was now a little clearer. For reasons still obscure, the program and the fellowship of AA could induce a surrender which could in turn lead to a period of no drinking. As might be expected, I too had a thrill of my own. I was getting in on what was happening, always an enjoyable experience. Still questing eagerly, I shifted my therapeutic attack. The job was now to induce surrender. When I tried to cause that, I ran into a whole nest of resistance to that idea totally new territory to be explored. As I continued my tour, it became ever more apparent that in everyone's psyche, there existed an unconquerable ego that bitterly opposed any thought of defeat until that ego was somehow reduced or rendered ineffective. No likelihood of surrender could be anticipated. So I think he's, he's, he's spot on in terms of identifying what the problem is. He's talking about step one, psychologically, spiritually, and then the two are joined. What is it that's happening? And he was an observer of that, and he wanted to understand it. The first one uh, from the psychiatric community to, to try to delve into the mystery of why AA works when other treatments uh, so often seem to fail, at least back in those days. The shift in emphasis from hitting bottom to surrender to ego reduction all occurred during the first five or six years after my initial contact with AA. I well remember the first AA meeting 
to which I spoke on the subject of ego reduction. AA, still very much in its infancy, was celebrating the third or fourth anniversary of one of the groups. The speaker immediately preceding me told in detail of the efforts of his group, his local group, which consisted of two men, to get him to dry up and become its third member. After several months of vain effort on their part and repeated nose dives on his, the speaker went on to say, quote, finally, I got cut down to size and have been sober ever since. His sobriety was a matter of some two or three years then. When my turn came to speak, I used his phrase cut down to size as a text around which to weave my remarks. Before long, out of the corner of my eye, I was conscious of a disconcerting stare. It was coming from the previous speaker. Looking a little more directly, I could see his eyes fixed on me in open-eyed wonder. It was perfectly clear that he was utterly amazed that he had said anything that made sense to a psychiatrist. The look of incredulity never left his face for my entire talk. The incident had one value in my eyes. It showed that two people, one approaching the matter clinically and the other relying on his own intuitive report of what had happened to him, both came up with exactly the same observation, the need for ego reduction. Harry goes on, during the past decade, my own endeavors have centered primarily upon the problem of ego reduction. How far I've been able to explore that territory is not at all certain. I have, however, made a little progress. I shall try to acquaint you with some of my findings, and second, to relate them to a the AA scene as I see it. As I've already stated, the fact that hitting bottom could produce a surrender that cut the ego to size was evident fairly soon. In time, two additional facts manifested themselves. The first was that a reduced ego has marvelous recuperative values, excuse me, has marvelous recuperative powers. The second was that surrender is an essentially disciplinary function and experience. The first is merely repeating a fact known to you all. It is common knowledge that a return of the full-fledged ego can happen at any time. Years of sobriety are no insurance against its resurgence. No AA, regardless of his veteran status, can ever relax his guard against the encroachment of a reviving ego. Now, I've said this uh, before in previous um, episodes on, on Tebow. When he says ego, he's talking about egotism. He's talking about inflated ego size, the ego taking on a disproportionate size within the psyche, within the whole person. It takes over. And when it takes over, it's crazy. <laughs> okay, uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Recently, one AA writing to another reported he was suffering, he feared, from halotosis, an obvious reference to the smugness and self-complacency that so easily can creep into the individual with years of sobriety behind him. The assumption that one has all the answers or the contrary, that one needs to know no answers and just follow AA are two indicators of trouble. In both open-mindedness is notably absent. Now we pay a lot of attention to that to that first part that that one has all the answers okay but but harry notes a second one uh, which is really important and that is that aa gives me all of my answers all i need is the 12 steps and this i hear all the time and and uh it's kind of like the church you know all i need is the church and then i i kind of dig in to beliefs and creeds and things of that nature. And, and I stop spiritual growing and my ego magnifies. If you've ever listened to some of these preachers on TV, you know what I'm talking about, okay? And, and, and he's, what he's saying is be careful 
because the same thing he noted could happen in AA, where spiritual growth and spiritual connectedness was no longer the emphasis. It was just AA, 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 and I become the interpreter of that. And, and you want to see grandiosity, you will see it in, in a good number of people within the program who think they have just found the answer and they are God's prophet. Um, look out, <laughs> look out. I, I run from the religious ones and I run from some of those uh, AA uh, Nazi fanatics. It's nice to have a psychiatrist agree with me once in a while. He goes on, perhaps as the commonest manifestation of the return of ego is witnessed in the individual who falls from his pink cloud, a state of mind familiar to you all. This blissful pink cloud state is a logical aftermath of surrender. The ego, which is full of striving, just quits and the individual senses peace and quiet within. The result is an enormous feeling of release and the person flies right up to his pink cloud and thinks he has found heaven on earth. This is why uh, they, they tell us don't make any major decisions the first year or so in, in the program. Y your head may be in the cloud and your feet are not firmly planted on the earth. S says everyone knows he is doomed to fall, but it is perhaps not equally clear that it is the ego slowly making its comeback that forces the descent from the pink cloud into the arena of life, where with the help of AA, he can learn how to become a sober person and not an angel. To be a human being is one of the most difficult challenges on the whole face of the earth. There's a Jewish um, story told that uh, when a human being walks by in heaven, all right, it's a story. When a human being passes by, the angels are required to bow. And you'd, you'd think that angels are of a higher order than human beings. But what the story is trying to say is no, human beings are higher than angels. Why? Because we have a much tougher job, a much tougher job. We have to balance spirit with physical, all right? And it is so easy to get that mix mixed up. It's very difficult to stay concentrated. That's why uh, the, angel, the angels bow in, in that story. And I would say for alcoholics and addicts of all co co sorts, it's, it, it's also maybe doubly difficult. Uh, because if we don't have a high degree of spirituality, a focused degree of spirituality, that egotism will reassert itself and the consequences are disastrous. They don't seem to be quite as disastrous for, quote, normal people. I had a wonderful first year sponsor who said, you know, don't, don't make your goal to become normal. If you have the normal level of spirituality that uh, people in AA have, you're likely to get drunk. If you have the normal level of spirituality that people have in church, uh, you're going to lose it. It's got to be sharp. It's got to be focused. And it's got to be pretty intense. Now, uh, we've come in some ways a long way from that, that, that maybe you can stay sober now just on meetings and just on uh, the fellowship. Uh, but watch for other addictions to show up. Uh, compulsive overeating, compulsive sexual acting out. Uh, all of those things that, that become substitutes uh, for genuine uh, surrender and reliance uh, upon the higher power. Anyway, he says, I, I could go on with many more examples familiar to you all of the danger of ever assuming that the ego is dead and buried. Its capacity for rebirth is utterly astounding and must never be forgotten. I use the analogy of... Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator. If you ever saw that movie, they would destroy him. And then like mercury, he, he, would, he would dissolve onto the ground. And then the mercury would come together and he would reconfigure. It's a ma ma marvelous uh, description, I think, of what happens to egotism in each of our lives. This, this is, this is going to happen to each of us. It can't be avoided. So, so you need to get familiar with it and, and, and understand how it looks 
and how it feels. He goes on, my second finding that surrender is a disciplinary experience requires explanation. In recent articles, I have shown that the ego basically must be forging continuously ahead. It operates on the unconscious assumption that it, the ego, can never be stopped. It takes for granted its right to go ahead. And in this respect, has no expectation of being stopped and no capacity to adjust to that eventuality. Stopping says in effect, you cannot continue, which is the essence of disciplinary control. The individual who cannot take a stopping is fundamentally an undisciplined person. This is why step 10, I think is so, so critical. It's watching yourself, watching yourself daily. There's an expression an old, an old AA fellow used, used to have, who's driving the bus? Pause long enough to see who's in the driver's seat of the bus of your life. Is it God giving guidance through your ego? Or is it your ego taking the wheel and uh, off he goes? The function of surrender in AA is now clear. It produces that stopping by causing individuals to say, I quit. I give up my headstrong ways. I've learned my lesson. Very often for the first time in that individual's adult life, he has surrendered and truly feels, thy will be done, not mine. When that is true, we have become, in fact, obedient servants of God. The spiritual life at that point is a reality. We have become members of the human race. This is where I think two-way prayer is is such a benefit that on a daily basis uh, you take your inventory it's not the only way but you take your inventory and you you receive your guidance and if you're asked to do five or six things at least this is the way i work it's the way dr bob used to work it you're asked to do five or six things very specifically i write them down put a little box next to them come back the next morning and did I act on that guidance? Was I a servant? Or was I just trying to get enough little power, get enough power from God to go ahead and keep doing what I want to do and totally disregard the guidance that I receive? It's a very different way of looking uh, at uh, the 11th step. But uh, I think it's uh, really in sync with what the Oxford group was about and what early AAs were about. He says, I have now presented the two points I wish to make. Namely, first, the ego is revivable. And second, surrender is a disciplinary experience. I next wish to assess their significance for AA as I see it. Primarily, the two points say quite simply, quote, AA can never just be a miracle. The simple act of surrender can produce sobriety by its stopping effect upon the ego. Unfortunately, that ego will return unless the individual learns to accept a disciplined way of life, which means the tendency for ego comeback is permanently checked. This is not new to AA members. They have learned that a single surrender is not enough. Under the wise leadership of the Founding Fathers, the need for continued endeavor to maintain that miracle has been steadily stressed. The 12 steps urge repeated inventory, not just one. And the 12th step itself is a routine reminder that one must work at preserving sobriety. Moreover, it is referred to as 12th step work which is exactly what it is. By that time, the miracle is for the other fellow. So it's not just what am I receiving, it's what am I giving? And am, is my relationship to the new person? Uh, and that new person can have 10 or 15 years, but if, they, if they're not, if they're not uh, doing this kind of in-depth work, treat them as a new person. Uh, because it's not just the drunk off the street. Uh, who needs this kind of change and transformation. It can well be people who've been around for 10, 12, 15, 20 years. In my own case, that, that's where I was. It was 20 years without a drink, 20 years sober, working in the AA program, but I was working it mechanically. And, and, and I had kind of lost that, uh, that 
direct connection with the higher power, because that requires real discipline in, in terms of specifically prayer and meditation. And I hadn't really found a form of prayer and meditation that fit my individual psyche needs. You know, I could do the mechanical stuff and I was doing that I'd read the 24 hour book and off I go, but, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. It says the 12 traditions are also part of the non-miracle aspect of AA. They represent, as Bill said, the meaning of the lessons of experience. They serve as guides for the inexperienced. In reality, they check the ways of the innocent and unwary. They bring the individual down to earth and present him with the facts of reality. In their own fashion, the traditions say, pay heed to the teachings of experience or you will court disaster. It is with reason that we talk of the sober voice of experience. My stress on the non-miracle elements of AA has a purpose. When I first made my acquaintance with AA, I rode the pink cloud with most of its members. I too went through a period of disillusionment. And fortunately for me, I came out with a faith far stronger than anything a pink cloud can supply. Mind you, I'm not selling miracles short. They do loosen the individual up. I now know, however, the truth of the biblical saying, by their works, you shall know them. Only through hard toil and labor can lasting results be obtained. I run into a number of people, <laughs> met one just the other day who uh, was doing two-way prayer. And then she said, well, I, I, I just kind of let it go. Uh, you know, and, and that's what we can do. You, it has to be a disciplined practice. It's better to show up every day for five minutes, you know, than it is to, well, every once in a while, I'm going to go take a yearly inventory or something like that. Too much time, too much water under the bridge. It, I have to keep a focus, a sharp focus on this egotism. I mean, it is amazing how quickly it can take over and take charge. So constant watchfulness is, is the answer, which then leads to constant prayer. 10 and 11 flow seamlessly into one another. And if they're really flowing, then they're going to flow into 12. The prayer is going to lead to action. As a consequence, Harry says, of the need for work to supplement any miracle, my interest in the non-miracle features has grown. I can accept more truly the necessity of organization, of structure, which curb as well as guide. I believe there must be meetings like this one to provide a sense of belonging to a big working organization of which each individual is but a part. And I believe that any group or individual who fails to, to participate in the enterprises of the organization is rendering himself and his group a disservice by not submitting to the disciplinary values inherent in those activities. He may be keeping the ego free of entanglements but he is also keeping himself unstopped. His chances of remaining sober are not of high order. He is really going it alone and is headed for an, another miracle that may or may not come off the next time. I made a decision uh, many years ago that AA for me, 12 step for me is rock bottom core. I'm not leaving it. I'm not leaving it, but it doesn't mean it's, I'm going to draw from it everything that I need. Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob, they were avid readers. They, they listened to other spiritual leaders, psychological uh, leaders, read books uh, galore. Dr. Bob's library was uh, pretty extensive. They fed this inner need for union with uh, with the divine that they had sought through their addiction they needed to have that fed 
uh, and fed on a daily basis. But AA or NA or CA or, or whatever your A might be, you know, make that rock bottom that you're not going to leave, that you're going to stick around, all right? But you're also going to grow. And you may not be drawing so much from meetings. You know, I hear a lot about the wisdom of the rooms. Well, there's a lot of idiocy in the rooms, too. You know? I mean, there are pockets of wisdom. Ain't no question about that. You know, I'm with, I'm with them on that. But if you're not supplementing it with other stuff, you're going to grow stagnant. At least that's my view. And if you think otherwise, uh, drop me a line, twowayprayer at gmail.com. I try to be open to other thoughts, but it's difficult. In closing, let me <laughs> reaffirm my proxy membership in AA. I have been in on its glowing start, and I've shared in its growing pains. And now I have reached the state of deep conviction in the soundness of the AA process, including its miracle aspect. I have tried to convey to you some of my observations on the nature of that process. I hope they will help in making the AA experience not just a miracle, but a way of life that is filled with eternal values. AA has, I can assure you, done just that for me. And um, I can join with Harry in assuring you that it has done that uh, for me as well, uh, particularly a renewed emphasis on steps 10, 11, and 12, that they're not just maintenance, and I'm not going back to uh, work in step six and five and nine and uh, bouncy, 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 uh, kind of the way some religious people uh, treat and can quote from the Gospels and the, and, the, and the Bible, you know. But 10, 11, and 12, solidly done, that you watch. You watch and you see where this ego is getting out of whack, and you will see it, and then you pray, and then you listen for another voice. You got the raucous voice of the ego, there's another voice that lives inside of every mind. And that voice is, uh, is, is the voice of the divine. You know, that, that's who we are. Uh, tap into it. It's there for a reason. And it's going to speak to you honestly, purely, unselfishly, and lovingly. That is the sound of its voice. And then you're going to act. And then AA becomes discovery. You know, your 12-step program becomes discovery. But you're out there growing and changing. And um, if I meet you three, five years from now, you're not going to be the same person. And that's what it's all about. So uh, I think I've enjoyed this revisitation of Harry Tebow. He was Bill Wilson's psychiatrist. Wilson got tremendously depressed. Harry was trying to help him, trying to teach him his emotional insecurity that he still suffered from. And I think that's the area that most of us uh, find we need to do work in, that uh, that little kid in us is uh, is still in there and, and can be causing trouble if we're not uh, tending to him or her and uh, growing in love and service and uh, doing God's will in the world. That's what we're here for. So hope this was helpful. Thank you for listening. Uh, God bless and keep coming back. Thank you.